Hello, everyone. I hope you all had a good lunch. Thanks again for making it out here today um, to this teach-in and our organizers for putting it together. Uh, our next speaker is Tomas Jimenez, um, coming from Stanford University, where he is a professor of sociology and comparative studies in race and ethnicity. Uh, he's also the director of graduate studies in sociology and director of the undergraduate program on urban studies. His research and writing focuses on immigration, assimilation, social mobility, and ethnic, ethnic and racial identity. He's the author of multiple books and uh, articles, including uh, a book called The Other Side of Assimilation, How Immigrants Are Changing American Life, and another book titled Replenished Ethnicity, Mexican Americans, Immigration, and Identity. Um, and I won't go through the many journals that he's published in. He's also a public intellectual, um, writing regularly and speaking to NPR, and um, has authored columns in the Washington Post, written on CNN.com, and written for uh, the Los Angeles Times. Um, and he also wanted everyone to know as well that he is the recipient of a um, sportsmanship award in the fourth grade. Um, so with those, um, with those wonderful credentials, let us please welcome uh, Tomas Jimenez. Thank you. Way to go. Thanks, Kathleen, for that introduction. I was joking with Kathleen when she said, is there anything you want me to tell them when I introduce you? And I said, well, I won the sportsmanship award in the Police Athletic League uh, Santa Clara Youth Soccer in, in 1985. And so I wanted people to know that I won that. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks for being here, and, uh, and thanks for your interest in this topic. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about what I think is perhaps the most important aspect of the so-called immigration debate today. And that is the issue of undocumented, unauthorized immigrants and their fate, and what their fate means for the future of this country. And I want to start off by setting the scene for you a little bit. This is not advancing, hold on. There we go. So I want to start off by setting the scene for you a little bit. Um, and, and I want to do that by telling you just a little bit in very broad terms about the immigrant population in the United States today. This is a graph that the Migration Policy Institute puts out every year. And it shows the total number of foreign-born individuals living in the United States, and that's the blue line. Um, let's see if I can get the laser pointer. That's the blue line right here. And then it also shows that population as a percent of the total US population, and that's this orange line. And this graph shows all immigrants, regardless of legal status, uh, regardless of country of origin, and what it shows is that we have today more immigrants than we've ever had in this nation's history. However, we're reaching a point that some people might say is normal relative to past periods of history. We are reaching a point where close to 14% of the population is foreign-born. When you combine the foreign-born population with the children of immigrants, it's about 25% of the population. And I just want to point out that the middle of the 20th century, in some ways, was sort of a weird period in, in historic terms. And it was a weird period because there were so few immigrants in the United States. Immigrants today, of course, come overwhelmingly from Latin America and from Asia. In previous eras, they came at first overwhelmingly from Northern Europe and then Southern and Eastern Europe. But I want to kind of focus in a little bit on how this population breaks down by legal status. Contrary to popular belief, the overwhelming majority of immigrants in the United States are here with authorization, with some kind of legal status. So if you look at the share of the foreign-born, let me just first say that this is a graph uh, that's put together by the Pew Research Center, dividing the immigrant population into different legal statuses. And almost half of all immigrants in the United States are citizens, almost half. And then um, another more than a quarter are lawful permanent residents. These are people who have green cards. And then you have a relatively small sliver that are Temporary migrants, these are people who are here on work visas or student visas. 
And then you have almost a quarter of the population that is unauthorized. These are people who either entered the United States without inspection and then stayed, or people who came in with a legal visa, overstayed their visa, and then their status lapsed. But I want, to, I want you to, to take home two things from this slide. The first is that the overwhelming majority of the people who are, were born in another country and who are in the United States are here legally. The second thing I want you to take home is that there is still a substantial share of that foreign-born population that is unauthorized. And it's that population that I want to focus the rest of my comments on. And you've probably heard people talk about this population uh, quite a bit. And talk about this population in terms of a crisis. This is an ad that was aired during the 2018 election about the uh, caravan that was supposedly um, uh, kind of storming the border from the so-called Northern Triangle countries. Uh, the president has talked a lot about um, today's undocumented, unauthorized immigrants in particular being perpetrators of crime, people who uh, are endangering the lives of people in the United States. And he felt so strongly about this uh, that he even opened up an office in U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement dedicated to handling cases of people who have been victims of crime at the hands of unauthorized immigrants. I am not exaggerating when I say that it is unclear what this office actually does. Uh, this is not hyperbole. They, uh, there, is, there is very little work for them to do. And there's very little work for them to do. The, the signal on this thing is weak. So I have to keep wandering over here to, there we go. I might as well just press the space bar. Um, and, and they have so little work to do because the fact is that immigrants are way less likely to make, commit crime than, um, than people who were born in the United States. And I want to put this in kind of recent historical context. And I want to lay out a couple of facts. The first is that the United States is about as safe as it's been in any time in the last 100 years. The United States is really, really, really safe. And it got really, really safe in about the last 23, 24 years. And over that time, we also had a massive influx of immigrants. And that's basically what this figure shows right here. This, is, um, this comes from the US Census Bureau, from the American Community Survey, and also from the FBI. And over here on the right pane, it reports the violent crime rate from 1980 to 2016. The violent crime rate has gone down by 36%. Over that time, our immigrant population has more than doubled. Now, I know what you're saying. Correlation is not causation, and you're right. Correlation is not causation. But there's a heck of a lot of correlation here uh, that appears no matter how we slice the data. So this is a graph that uh, the Washington Post Wonk blog published a couple of years ago. And it shows the uh, undocumented population of a sh as a share of a state's population down here um, plotted against the violent crime rate. And each of these dots represents one state in one year and its violent crime rate and the share of the population in that state that's undocumented. There is a clear pattern here which shows that the more undocumented immigrants you have in your state, the lower the crime rate. We can drill down to the city level. And here we're not talking about just unauthorized immigrants, we're talking about all immigrants. Each of these dots represents a city in a particular year, showing the overall crime rate plotted with the size of the foreign-born population. Miami-Dade County has the highest percentage of immigrants of any county in the United States. It also has an amazingly low crime rate. New York City, Gotham, is not Gotham anymore. And one of the reasons it's not Gotham anymore is because it had a massive influx of immigrants in the last few decades. If you talk to the leading experts in the country, the leading criminologists in the country, they'll say that there's lots of reasons why the crime rate dropped so dramatically in the last generation. One of the primary reasons is that we had an influx of really, really law-abiding people, and those people are immigrants. Let's drill down to Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City saw its immigrant population go up 157%, and in the same period of time, assaults went down 12%, robberies down 43%, and murders down 
45%. Again, correlation is not causation, but the correlations are fairly strong. The other thing you've probably heard is that we have a border that is out of control. A border where people are flooding across and there's a need to ramp up border enforcement more than ever. Now bear in mind, and I'm sure others will talk about this this afternoon if we haven't already, bear in mind that we have ramped up border enforcement in the last generation like no other time in American history. With more walls, with more border patrol uh, officials, with ground sensors, with stadium lighting, with unmanned drones, with cameras. Uh, we have a lot of border security, but you've also heard, I'm sure, that there are marauding immigrants who are seeking to come across the border and do us harm. I'm here to tell you that the border has not been more in control in four decades. This, this is the a graph of the size of the undocumented population in the United States from 1990 to 2017. Starting with the Great Recession, or I should say right before the Great Recession, the size of the undocumented population peaked at about 12.2 million individuals. Since that time, the size of the undocumented population has gone down dramatically, dramatically. We stand now with an undocumented population at about 10.5 million. A lot of reasons why the undocumented immigrant population declined. Part of it was there was really no more undocumented immigration, partly because of the Great Recession and partly because of changes that were happening in Mexico, both in terms of its age structure, that is the aging of the population, and also terms of economic opportunity. And I mentioned Mexico because Mexico has historically been the largest source country of unauthorized immigration. The other reason the unauthorized population declined was because of mass deportations. You might know that uh, President Obama's administration set a record for the no most deportations of any administration in American history. For a period of about two to three years, they were deporting around 400,000 people. Uh, and then the de deportations declined after that. But suffice to say, the unauthorized population has shrunk. And so have apprehensions at the U.S.-Mexico border. Customs and Border Protection keeps track of how many people they apprehend every year. And this graph shows the number of people apprehended going from 1962 to 2019. And these are estimates from 2019. We still don't have the full figures in. And what it shows is that we had a ton of deportations in the late 90s and in the early 2000s. And then... Once again, starting with the Great Recession, there was a plummet in the number of apprehensions, and we reached the lowest number of apprehensions in 2016 since the early 1970s. We had a spike in 2019, and now there's a good reason to think it's going to go back down. I want to emphasize this point. If you draw a straight line from this period, the most recent period, back to the early 1970s, we are apprehending as many people today, roughly speaking, as we did in the early 1970s. Bear in mind that the early 1970s, we had far fewer border patrol. We have around 20,000 border patrol today. So our capacity to, uh, to uh, apprehend people crossing the U.S.-Mexico border is greater than ever, and we're catching fewer and fewer people. This is the best indicator we have of how little traffic there is across the U.S.-Mexico border. And I mentioned a second ago that Mexico has become, um, is, is now a minority source country of undocumented immigration. If you look at who's getting apprehended coming across the U.S.-Mexico border, it is now Central Americans much more than Mexicans. When I was a brand new assistant professor at UC San Diego, I took a tour of the, with the Border Patrol. And the Border Patrol have a, had a terminology of people who crossed, and there was a category called OTM, other than Mexican. And what the Border Patrol told us, and, the, and the, their own stats bear this out, is for every nine Mexican people they caught, they caught one non-OTM, other than Mexican. Today, uh, Mexicans are the minority, and in fact, it's OTMs that constitute the majority. But even with the spike in asylum seekers, these are mostly asylum seekers from Central America, we're nowhere near the 1.6 million apprehensions that we were at its peak. 
So two things I want you to know. This is kind of a reactive addressing of some of the immigration debate as it relates to unauthorized immigration. One is that we have uh, lower crime rates in part because we have so many immigrants in the United States. And the second thing is that the border is actually as secure as it's been in 50 years. So I want to kind of put that in the back of your mind and I want to make the case for legalization. The fact is we have a, we've had a decline in the number of unauthorized immigrants in the United States, but we still have a lot of unauthorized immigrants. And their lives are dramatically shaped by the fact that they lack legal status. But it's not just their lives that are impacted. It's the lives of every future generation that descends from those immigrants. And moreover, I want to make the argument that the rest of us, the rest of us who are not undocumented are affected by the fact that we have so many people who are undocumented in the United States and not affected in the way that you've heard, not because we're victims of crime, but because we're victims of a system that doesn't allow people to realize their full potential. So let me tell you what is legalization first. We actually have no legalization system in place right now. We have a semblance of a legalization, a sort of quasi-legalization program called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. In 2012, President Obama signed an executive order that gave certain individuals, people who were brought here as children, reprieve from deportation, it also, protection from deportation. It also gave them the opportunity to get work permits, to get social security numbers, and having a social security number allowed them to get driver's licenses. DACA is still in place. Uh, the Supreme Court will decide on DACA's fate and announces, is deciding on DACA's fate and will likely announce their decision sometime this spring. The kind of legalization that I'm advocating for is something that's much broader. Man, where is the signal? It's something that's much broader. Uh, the legalization that I'm advocating for would legalize most, if not all, but most of the 10.5 million people that are currently unauthorized. And they would have to pass a background check, they would have to pay any back taxes, and then they would have to agree to learn English. And these are sort of the, plat this is a platform of comprehensive immigration reform, which was a approach to immigration reform that was talked about for about two decades, which is no longer talked about. But I think we actually have to go back to something like this. And I want to tell you why. The reason is that a legalization program is a de facto assimilation program. Immigra opinions about immigration in the United States are not driven primarily by economic threat. They're not driven by a sense that people are coming to take our jobs or that immigrants in general are somehow unfairly taking them a system, from a system. They're driven by a sense of cultural threat. That's the primary driver. But when you give people an opportunity to maximize their ability to realize their economic potential, that was a mouthful, to give them the opportunity to realize their economic potential, the kinds of cultural fears that we often have about immigration tend to dissipate. And I think a legalization program does that. And you get a sense of how that happens uh, by thinking about the kinds of integration that is already happening among unauthorized immigrants. The fact is there's lots of integration happening. And part of the integration that's happening is, is a result of the fact that unauthorized immigrants, on average, have been here for quite a while. This is a graph put out by the Pew Research Center, and it shows the proportion of the unauthorized population that has been here for a decade or more. More than two-thirds of the unauthorized population have been here for a decade or more. And in that decade plus that they've been here, there is some semblance of integration, some semblance of assimilation happening. They own homes, they have children, in most cases if they have children, their children are US born citizens. They have jobs, they pay taxes, they are our friends, they are our neighbors, they are our family members. There's some integration that is happening. But that integration is stalled by the fact that their legal status holds them back. And you get a sense of the way in which their legal status holds them back by comparing what happens when a population is able to legalize and what happens when a population is not able to legalize. Some colleagues of mine at UC Irvine 
did a study of the Mexican origin population plus a number of other immigrant populations in Los Angeles County. And they focused in particular on the Mexican population. And they looked at the educational trajectories of men and women whose immigrant origin ancestor came to the United States undocumented. And then they compared the people whose ancestors were able to legalize and those who weren't, and then followed over the course of generations their educational trajectory. Now I want to pause, and just before I walk you through this, I want to pause to say a little bit about the legalization that many of those people benefited from. And it was a legalization in 1986 called the Immigration Reform and Control Act. And President Reagan signed the largest legalization in this country's history and made the same case that I'm making right now, which is legalization will allow people to come out from under the shadows. I know that's a widely used notion to talk about what legalization does, but to allow them to come out from under the shadows and become full participants in American society. And President Reagan was right. That's exactly what it did. And let me, and, I, and I'm basing that on, on these data and others. So these data compare the, the educational trajectories when uh, someone's grandparent, great-grandparent, or great-great-grandparent was, excuse me, great-grandparent, parent, grandparent, or great-grandparent was able to legalize. And I want you to compare the educational trajectories. We're looking here at number of years of education of, of Mexican origin men who, who's, uh, in this case, their mother, grandmother, uh, excuse me, mo mothers, grandmother, and great-grandmother legalized. And if you look at their educational trajectories, not only do they start higher, they continue to elevate over time such that the average uh, Mexican man who's, uh, who's female ancestor is able to legalize, uh, has more than a high school degree. Compare that to those who were not able to legalize, and the, edu and the average educational attainment for two and a half generations is below a high school degree. The same pattern attains when we um, compare that to women. And, and in fact, for women in Los Angeles County, uh, whose immigrant ancestor is able to legalize, the number of years of education they get by the 3.5 generation, that is their, their great-grandmother legalized, is 3.7 years, which is exactly the average of white women in LA County. They fully catch up. This right here represents the penalty in perhaps the most important indicator of integration we have, which is education. It represents the penalty for being unauthorized. We don't have anything like the 1986 Immigration and Reform and Control Act, but what we have today is DACA, which is that temporary program. And DACA, for the people who received it, was a boon to their integration. The graph I'm showing you here comes from research done by the political scientist Tom Wong, and he surveyed DACA recipients, asking them how their lives had changed after they received DACA. And what he shows, and I'm going to read this off the screen here too, is that 69% got a job with better pay. 89% got a driver's license. 92% of those who were already in school said that they pursued edu educational opportunities that they previously could not. The average age wage, excuse me, average wage went up by 45%. 57% were able to earn more money, which, which has helped their family. 21% bought a new car. And then there was a proposed program that would have legalized parents called DAPA, um, and that never materialized. Actually, it was, it was held up in courts and blocked by the courts. Suffice to say that the lives of these individuals improved dramatically. Was DACA a cause of that? Some of my colleagues and I at Stanford think so. We compared uh, some health data from Oregon, and we compared the uh, a set of women who were eligible for DACA and women who were ineligible from DACA, and we compared the eligibility just before and just after the birth date cutoff line. So if you were born on before June 15, 1981, you were ineligible for DACA. If you were born after June 15, 1981, you were eligible. This is what social scientists call an opportunity to look at a natural experiment. There's no reason to think that people born a little bit before and a little bit after DACA are any different from each other in any other way except that one is eligible for DACA and one is not. 
And then we looked at the diagnosis of anxiety and, ju and adjustment disorder, which is a, a kind of mental health uh, affliction for children. And we looked at their US-born children and their rates of adjustment anxiety uh, disorder. And what we found is that if your mother was eligible for DACA, your rates of anxiety and adjustment disorder were significantly lower than if your mother was ineligible. This is, for social science, it's very hard to make causal claims about immigration policy. This is about as good as we can do. And it certainly supports the data I showed you on the last slide. So legalization is really effective even when it's minimal, as in the case of DACA. And if you listen to the words of people who have been recipients of DACA, I think you get a fuller picture. As one individual told Time Magazine in 2017, my life totally changed when I received DACA. For one, I was the first undocumented student admitted to the University of Alabama. I still have my acceptance letter because that was something that I had never imagined happening. I graduated from high school in 2010. And when I graduated, I thought I would never be able to go to college. I remember walking across the graduation stage and just thinking to myself, you know, this is it. When I walk off the stage, there's no more opportunities. There's nothing for me. There's nothing whatsoever. I knew that other students felt the same and I wanted to be able to help them. This is the last section I want to talk about, but and it's the argument that Americans actually want legalization. And this is where the title of my talk comes into play, which says that we are sort of defying caricatures. There are caricatures in the immigration debate. There are those who are Republican conservatives who want to kick everyone out and don't want any immigrants here. And then, and I'm, I'm portraying the caricatures, I'm not offering my opinion. And then on the, on the left, there are liberals and Democrats who want open borders and just want to let anyone in. That, those people don't really exist in the immigration debate as much as we think they do. And I want to prove that. So there is certainly a partisan divide on views about immigration, including with respect to legalization. But I want to suggest that we're not as divided as we think. I know this seems crazy to say in these times, but I'm making the argument anyway because I look at the data. So this is a, a poll that was fielded by the Pew Research Center that, that, at, that looked at the percentage of people who feel that giving people, uh, giving people who come to the US illegally a way to gain legal status is like rewarding them for doing something wrong or don't think that it's a reward for doing something wrong. The majority of Americans, more than two thirds, think that it's not a reward for doing something wrong. And Republicans are quite divided with even a slight majority, uh, excuse me, are almost evenly divided in their thinking. Democrats are not quite as divided. I'm telling you, I got two minutes. I promised I would speak for 25 minutes. I'm sorry, I'm wrapping up here. Um, <laughs> further defying caricature is, uh, is um, people's opinions about whether they think that immigration is good or bad for the country. There's a Quinnipiac poll taken in 2019 last summer. 70% of Americans think overall that, uh, that immigrants are good for the country. Half of Republicans think that immigrants are good for the country. Almost 90%, almost 9 in 10 Democrats, and almost 3 quarters of independents. And remember that there's a kind of myth of the independents. Independents either lean Republican or lean Democrat, but here we've put them all together. They also favor a legalization program. This is a poll taken by CNN, and let me say that this poll has been, these findings have been repeated over and over and over again. 80% of Americans favor a plan for legal residency. That is the kind of legalization that I'm talking about. 80% of Americans, you can't get 80% of Americans to agree on anything right now, but they agree on this. 80% of Americans also are in favor of DACA. This is a poll that comes from CNN as well. Once again, 80%. You can't get 80% of Americans to agree on anything. And research that I've done with some colleagues in New Mexico and Arizona shows that when people believe that immigration policies are going to become more welcoming, they show more positive social psychological affect, and they feel like they belong more in their state. And this includes not only the Latinos in these two states, two states, but the whites. There are partisan differences that I'm going to not talk about in the interest of time, but, the, but whites overall feel like they belong more and have more positive affect if they think immigration policies are going to be more welcoming. And let me just close 
uh, by, well, let, me, let me read you one quote from somebody we interviewed that I think really defies characters. This is Linda Jones. So when we interviewed, she's a small business owner in New Mexico. She's an, she's an ardent Trump supporter, uh, voted for him and will vote for him again. But when we asked her about what to do about the unauthorized immigrant population in the United States, she said, I don't want people rounded up. I don't think anybody really does, no matter how they characterize it, even nationally. I don't think it's appropriate to go round people up like that that are here for a certain period of time. I'd like to see it done more like if you've been here for a number of years and can show proof of residency and proof you've got a job, you should be able to walk into an office somewhere and sign up for the road to citizenship and get a legal card immediately. Okay, there's a moral imperative. This is honestly the close. There's a moral, there's a moral imperative for, uh, for legalization too. I would argue that the benefits are widespread, that legalization is not an individual benefit, it's a collective good. And it's a collective good because it benefits not only the recipients and their own economic mobility across generations, but it also benefits US-born generations that are the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and it benefits the US economy. Go back to those findings that I showed you related to DACA and how much better off those individuals were economically, that means they're more economic, they're better economic contributors. And then I think there is an argument for legalization if you care about democracy. People who are governed by a set of laws ought to have say in how those laws are made. And if people are going to be residing here for a long time, they ought to be brought into the political fold so that they can live out what we think are some of the core, at least I think are the core principle of democracy, is that, which is that if you live under a set of laws, you ought to have some say. And if you're a pragmatist, if all you care about whether what we, what we can get done, mass deportations, deporting 10.5 million people would be unbelievably disruptive economically, disruptive socially, and disruptive politically. Thanks for listening, and sorry I went over. Uh, thank you, Professor Jimenez, for those remarks. And we can now open it up for uh, Q&A. Uh, we do have some microphones going around, so if you have a question, just please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to arrive. Thank you. Uh, what do you think would be a fair, just, and appropriate uh, immigration policy for the United States? Wow. <laughs> um, well, so I'm, I think you know that I think one of the fair, just, and just policies would be a program that allows people to be put on a, a pathway that could potentially result in, in citizenship. Um, I do think that a country has the right to say who comes in and who doesn't. Uh, I think that, um, and this is based off of kind of principles of democracy, that if you're in a political community, you get to say who's in your political community and, and who's not. And I think that a fair and just immigration policy in the United States has to be based on um, the, the principles that are foundational to our country. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, right now we are, and I'm, I'm somewhat punting on your question, I realize, uh, but right now we are not doing our fair share in being a place where uh, life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness exist in abundance uh, in terms of our refugee policy. Um, so I think a fair and just policy would be actually doing more uh, to, to allow refugees in and do what we've done with our refugee policy uh, over the last more than half century which is to help refugees integrate and help them be contributors to the United States, which is exactly what they've done since we've had a refugee policy. Um, I think we have to have a policy that's based um, partly on the economic needs in the United States, but not exclusively. The immigrants, when they come here, have to have an opportunity to be able to stay if they meet certain criteria, if they meet criteria set forth by the members of the political community who get to have a say in and what those criteria are. To lay out a comprehensive immigration policy at a forum like this uh, is beyond my capacity. Uh, and there's lots of immigration lawyers here in the front row. And, and if you come down after, they will tell you exactly the answer. No, it's extremely difficult. And so I, you know, I don't want to pretend that it's, it's 
that there's an easy answer. And I've kind of given what I think is part of an answer. Um, but I think that no matter where you stand on the issue, you have to recognize that it, the, the complexity of managing migration between two places, or between more than two places, um, it's incredibly difficult. The, the kinds of economic interests, the humanitarian interests, uh, the social interests that are involved make it extremely complicated. And so even the most well-meaning administration would have difficult, as has had difficulty coming up with a fair and just immigration policy precisely because it's, it's difficult. So, you know, and I'm, I'm rambling on right now showing just how difficult it is. Now I'm asking for an opinion. Okay. I have a friend whose in-laws live in a Central American country in which they're fairly wealthy and they have to have two armed guards at their doors mm -hmm. 24 hours. Now, what is your, what are your thoughts about America trying to help these countries who are having so much trouble with these gangs and problems that are forcing immigration into the United States? I mean, I, I think we should help. Uh, and we have had policies in place that does seek to make those countries more stable. The Trump administration has pulled that funding um, and, and pulled it to sort of create more, than a, more of a stick and said that we're, we're sort of going to use the pulling of our funding to punish you for not doing more to stabilize and, or have more kind of law and order in your country. Um, I don't know empirically what effect that has had. Um, I, would, I would hypothesize that it has not been positive. Um, there has been talk of offering more direct military assistance and beyond sort of funding, but actually having a military presence in those countries, and there's lots of historical reasons to not do that. Uh, that has not gone well in the past. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, th I think we should do more. I think going back to my earlier response, recognizing the complexity of the issue, you know, the, the people who are fleeing Central American countries are mostly fleeing violence, but um, under, um, under kind of UN definitions of what, what constitutes a refugee, they are not, un most of them are not under one of the protected categories of, uh, which, which, would, um, which would kind of trigger a designation of refugees. That's, that makes part of it, that's part of what makes it complicated. Um, but the, the fact is that most people don't want to migrate. They'd rather, and most people don't migrate, they'd rather stay where they are. Uh, and so I think to the extent that we can help people you know, pursue their aspirations where they live, which is what most people want to do, we should. Um, and, you know, but, but that's not happening. The fact is that people are migrating. And I mean, there are others who have already talked about and are in a better position to talk about the disastrous policy that we've had in terms of our response to um, what is in historical terms not that big of a wave of refugees. Um, although we treated it as such, uh, I'll leave it there to take some more questions. <clears throat> Thank you for the great talk and sharing uh, illuminating information with us. Um, I mostly certainly agree with you about the legalization aspect, and then it's really great to see the DACA recipients are getting that, you know, all those benefits, you know, like more economic opportunities and all that. Um, what I want to ask you about is actually, I seem I have noticed that people who support maybe President Trump's stance on strengthening the border or even you know putting up a wall and deporting these uh, unauthorized immigrants, they seem to have this notion about immigrants taking their jobs away. Mm -hmm. Like you know, if immigrants get those better economic opportunities, like what happened to native-born you know Americans, like which. I wish I have a better explanation for them that because I think immigrants are taking jobs that they don't want to have, mm -hmm. you know, like difficult jobs. But would you have any maybe data or like, you know, kind of research that you can share with us about that? Sure. So um, there's a debate among economists about whether immigrants 
uh, take jobs, so in economic terms, are they replacements of US-born workers, uh, or do they not take their jobs, and in economic terms, are they complements? Um, and the debate is sort of rages, uh, and basically what economists try to do is show that uh, what happens when a group of immigrants settle in a place, what happens to the wages of US-born workers. So you can think of a, a hypothetical US-born worker who, let's say, loses their job because an immigrant takes it, there's a possibility that they take another job that is the US-born worker, and the job pays even better. So and that's a kind of complement case. Um, and and the, the worst case scenario uh, is somewhere around 8% decline in the wages of some. It's usually um, high school dropouts, often minority, uh, the population, about an 8% decline in their wages. That's the worst case scenario. And there are economists who question whether that worst case scenario even uh, materializes, depending, depending on how you look at the data. Um, but I mentioned earlier that I think immigration attitudes are not driven primarily by economic fears. They're driven mostly by cultural fears. And um, immigration is also uh, an issue that tends to be important to people when politicians make it important to people. So if, you, if, if politicians aren't really talking about immigration, and I'm summarizing here political science data, if, if politicians aren't really talking about immigration, and, and you look at, like Gallup asked people what the most important issues are to them, immigration falls way down. People actually don't care that much about it unless people incite them to care a lot about it, which I, I think is what's happening right now. Um, and there's a, there's a solid quarter to a third of the American electorate who has um, pretty restrictionist views about immigration. And, and people haven't really changed their minds lately. If anything, their minds, the, the, their position on immigration has just become firmer, either much more kind of accommodating in terms of their attitudes about immigrants or much more restrictionist. And in fact, what we've seen on the accommodating side is that that population has actually grown, not only in size, but also in the kind of strength of their feelings. I think the other thing to say is that this also comes from political science research is that people voted for the president for lots of different reasons. And there are lots of people who voted for the president primarily because of immigration, but, but not everyone who voted for him voted primarily because of immigration. And then we'll come down here. I promise to be quicker. Thank you. Or maybe. Uh, I may have misunderstood you, but I thought earlier in your talk you said something, made a statement that right now we would have no process of legalization. But, but I'm, you know, I'm sure you didn't quite mean what I thought that. You, people do get green cards. People do get oh, yes, uh, citizenship. Yes. But could you describe the process right now of how, say, somebody who's been here five years or, or so, moved here for a job, but then decide they want to get residence permit and a job. How does that work? And, but I've also heard reports from immigrants uh, who are trying to do that, of this taking five, 10, 15, 20 years. What percentage of the pro people are going, the applicants are going through that relatively quickly, and how many are taking outrageous amounts of time and money? The short answer to your question is I don't know. Um, the, the, the first part of your question, so, so you're right, you, you, um, you didn't mis, mishear me, but, um, but I didn't mean to apply that, imply that nobody is, be, is moving on to citizenship or green card status. Lots of people are doing that. Lots, otherwise, we wouldn't have a plurality of the immigrant population that are, that are U.S. citizens and, and a majority of the U.S. citizens are green card holders. I, and in fact, there are some people who are undocumented who are becoming legal through various channels. It's kind of complicated how that happens, um, but people who are here on some sort of temporary visa often have an opportunity to apply to have a green card. There's a five-year period that you wait. I'm kind of giving you the prototypical case. There are immigration attorneys in the front row who can, who can frown at me if I'm getting this totally wrong. Um, you, there's a, usually a five-year period that you wait, and then you apply for citizenship. Where I think you are correct, and this comes from people I know who are clinicians, people who work in and do uh, immigration law work, that that process under the Trump administration has slowed down dramatically. Uh, that cases that come through US, um, U.S. citizenship and immigration services are being slowed down 
partly because the people who process those applications are being given virtually no discretion. And any, so in the past they might have had some discretion to make decisions about cases, and now any question about a case has to go uh, before a judge, has to go before a higher authority to make some determination. Kit, how am I doing? Thank you. Um, what else could you say? Uh, um, so it, is, it has been slowed down quite a bit. Uh, but there are people who are still becoming legal, and even including among the undocumented, although it's not a big population. Wait for the microphone. Thank you for the talk. Um, could you speak more up about the agree to learn English as one of the proposed um, um, requirement yeah. for uh, your notion of larger legalization, mm -hmm. especially for it to be one to be deliberately laid out there as one of the requirement? Thank yeah. You. So this is um, this. I put that up there for two, maybe three reasons. One. It's because when there has been some legalization legislation on the table, that was one of the components. And it was one of the components, I think, partly to address the cultural, partly for political reasons, because there are people who worry about the cultural aspect of legalizing people, that those people aren't going to become part of our culture. In the United States, nothing constitutes the nucleus of American culture more than speaking English. Uh, and in fact, my, my colleagues who study English language acquisition say the United States remains a graveyard for non-English languages, much to the chagrin of immigrant parents, including mine. Um, and so, uh, two minutes, okay. Um, so part of it is for political reasons. And then the other component of it, I think, is because it actually carves out a space to put resources behind helping people learn English. So beyond the kind of addressing political fears, speaking English, is associated with, uh, with higher earnings. It's associated with parents being more involved in their schools. There's nothing in here, and in fact, Americans, if you look at um, polling data, wouldn't, wouldn't say that people should forget the language that they brought with them or their parents or their grandparents brought with them, but that English is, is important. And so it's, it's a, and in fact, if you, if you look at polling data about immigrants, about 90% of immigrants say in order to be American, one needs to speak English. So it's kind of, that's another area where everyone agrees it's really important. So I put it in there for pol policy reasons, political reasons, and also because I think it reflects um, a, a, a proposal that needs to be revived. Great. Um, please join me in uh, again thanking Professor Thomas. Thank you. Smith for a wonderful talk. Thank you.